I think the question, the more intellectually honest question is what would Slack and Uber have gone public at today with a 5% tenure? And I think the answer, if you're going to be intellectually honest, is a very different valuation than when it went out when the tenure was zero. It's going to be hard to make outsized returns unless and until the entry price is completely correct. And I think they've partially corrected, but they may not have fully corrected because people, I think, always want to believe that there's going to be a bounce back. Yeah. And it takes time to kill that hope. <laughs> I, think that, I think that might be the, capit- the capitulation. The capitulation is... Yeah. No, I think, the, I, think, I think that capitulation is starting to happen, to be honest. I mean, I, I, that, that was my observation. I, th- I feel like everything was so shut down last year, the start of this year, through the summer. And then in the fall, like just the last couple of months, it feels like there's this capitulation where it's like, okay, we're worth 80% less, but we need money. Let's do the deal. Okay, we'll put money in. I don't think the reset can happen until Stripe goes public. I'll be very specific. I think that is the company that sets the cascading valuation framework for every other company. So I think all of this is a bunch of people, us blathering on and making stuff up. I think the true numerical forcing function, the clearing event happens when they go public because it will, it will be, you won't be able to hide. Like I think we all would say it's the best run company that's private. It's the most technical it's gotten the most people it's gotten the most pristine cap table it's raised the most money at the like it's done everything right it's the gold standard yes and what their valuation is is then what you can expect if you are of that caliber or you can expect a lower valuation if you are not of their caliber and i think that until we know what that is we're all going to be hoping and but we know that hope isn't a strategy so my, my takeaway from all of this is just more that people have to really right size the portfolio, sell what you can, find liquidity where there are people that want to buy at different entry prices. They may not be the price that you thought originally, but you know, makes sense for them and their risk profile in this moment in time. All of this stuff has to happen to actively manage to exits, I think. Well, and there's a new phenomenon that's going on that I've been seeing a lot of. I've, I've been approached by a number of people who are doing buying strips of uh, GP interest and strips of LP interest in venture funds from the last 10 years, I got offered for a 5x on paper fund, like three point whatever x, you know, and you could clear out, like you're saying some of your shares, I got offered, you know, half price, basically, by some people who I think, I don't want to say they're bottom feeders, but I think they're maybe optimistic about certain names. And yeah, I've noticed that the amount of activity from secondary brokers seems to have increased. And yeah, yeah, and and specifically the the emails that I get that are interesting are the ones where they're asking me to sell shares. So when someone's yes. offering you, that doesn't mean anything because there may not be any transactions clearing. But when they have definite buyer interest at a certain price, that tells you that the market now has found or is in the process of finding the market clearing price. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think we do actually know from the secondary market, kind of where a lot of these unicorns are at. My guess is- And what would you say on average? Half? Yeah. Half price? There's a lot of half price. That's what I see. Um, I see a lot of half price action. But that doesn't mean- I'm not not trying to be a wet blanket, guys, but the average SaaS company that's public is down 75%. If you look at the fintech space, these companies are down 80 to 90%. So how can half be reasonable? Well, Well, it's just for certain names, yeah. Because I think the the really bad names don't get any liquidity. Like there's just no buyers. So you're talking about names where there's already a buyer, so that's going to bias it towards the better companies. No, no, I'm saying when Square and Adyen, these are great companies, right, that are down 80, 90%. How can a private illiquid company be only down 50%. Maybe it's not priced correctly, but maybe also there's been two or three years of growth since that last private valuation. So maybe there's some selection bias, maybe it's there's 20, 30% growth. Yeah, but but Adyen and Stripe have all, I mean, Square have also grown by 50%. I mean, you also have, let me, we, we have a comp on this, which is Instacart, 39 billion peak profit market valuation. It's trading at like six and a half billion, which I think is exactly what you said, Jamath, when we were pricing it we we looked at that 800 that million remember we, i think we're not no yeah. but i i had said 800 million and i just put it at like there was 800 million in advertising revenue and i said okay you know seven eight nine times that that top line or if, if i said if it was if it was 50 percent margin you could give it 20x so i think that's how i came up with my number and i think we came up with eight 
based on that. And you know, sure enough, that's basically where it's trading, 6.8 billion right yeah, now. Yeah, that's amazing. It's down 26% since it IPO'd. Now, I will say that Instacart is an example of a company that has historically had very high burn and it's a very capital intensive business relatively. Whereas a good software business, like take a Clavio, for example, uh, is much more capital efficient and should be doing better. Clavio is down 16% since this IPO. Yeah, market cap about 7 billion. So yeah, it's an ugly story. I mean, even for the names that just IPO'd, it's not looking too good. Yeah. I mean, revenue, profits, that that clears it out. I do think there's going to be a lot of GPs who are... Arm down... 21% since it's a big IPO. number. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Look, I think the market has just turned very negative very recently. It comes back to this GDP report. You know, when I saw the 4.9% number, I mean, the thing that occurred to me, the, the larger theme is that there's such a divergence right now between Main Street and Wall Street. Explain why the GDP is so strong right now. And that would indicate that the economy is strong. Therefore, Stock should go up, right? Why, why is that not happening? I think this is the thing that's maybe confusing for people. Well, I mean, I'm not sure I can fully explain it because I think there's a lot of contradictory data. But if you look at Main Street, you're seeing whatever, 4.9% GDP growth. You're seeing pretty robust employment numbers. The consumer seems to be holding up. But if you look at Wall Street and the investment side of things, it's pretty miserable. The whole stock market this year is being held up by seven stocks. The so-called Magnificent Seven is the top seven tech names in the yep. S&P 500. If you look at the overall S&P 500, excluding those names, it's flat for the year. And it's basically given back all the gains. And now those seven names are starting to crack. So just in the last week Google or so. Google and Tesla went down a bit, yeah. Yeah, we're seeing them go down. And so, Facebook, yeah. And Facebook. So we're seeing, and then, you know, Microsoft had a great quarter, but it's now down. It's given back that that pop. So you're seeing that on the investment side of things, uh, it's still pretty grim out there because people are now pricing in higher rates for longer. That's basically what's happening. And the thing I wonder about, the, I mean, here's the disconnect, is that ultimately what happens on Wall Street affects the consumer. Their 401ks go down in value. The value of their houses go down because now you can't if you if you sell your house, you lose your three percent mortgage. Now you have to get a new one at eight percent. So everyone's stopped trying to sell their house. The number of real estate transactions has gone down a lot. That's gradually working its way through the system. So at some point the consumer realizes that they're just not as wealthy as they thought they were. That's the wealth effect. And they just stop spending as freely. And we already know that credit card debt and especially credit card servicing costs are at all-time highs because of these high interest rates. So at some point, you just wonder if the consumer is like Wiley e. Coyote and has gone off a cliff but just hasn't looked down yet. Yeah, just like the country, just like our <laughs> government. It's like we're just, everybody's just spending and, and nobody's actually paying attention to the balance sheet, whether it's the government or individuals apparently because credit card debt's now at its highest and, and people are still YOLO. I, I don't, I mean, it's because uh, uh, the only possible explanation with the consumer is that consumers' wages and the unemployment, the low unemployment, persistent low unemployment, the number of jobs available, is just making everybody super confident. But th that's got to end at some point, right? Doesn't it? I think if companies so. I, keep cutting their belts. I don't think Wall Street and, and Main Street can be disconnected forever. I think it's got to reconcile one way or another. Yeah, I agree. So I would describe our economic situation as, as fragile. I mean, I think most commentators like Bill Ackman uh, still thinks that things are going to turn south that this this gdp number is sort of a peak number i don't know i mean it's just things still seem kind of shaky to me and not this exactly be one the, of them. not exactly the recipe that you want when you have this massive geopolitical instability yeah exactly that that, that double whammy and then plus the election coming up and, and the chaos that that could cause in the country it's kind of like that quote about going bankrupt how did it happen slowly and then all at once I think that's kind of what we're heading towards. This, is, this has been happening slowly, and then everybody's going to wake up with a heck of a credit card bill at 15 or 20%, and they're not going to be able to pay it. Well, the, just the, like government, the, United the government will have to intervene. They're, 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 they can't be in a situation where... I agree with Jamal. A large percentage of the U.S. consumers just can't... This is my point of cripple. view on, yeah, on consumer and all this commercial real estate and the bank loans. 